Okay, so let's welcome Professor Pei for his second talk. Thank, thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank the students for organizing this. This has been a great meeting, and they're the ones who sent us the invitations and we're all this together. So. Okay, so this is my last, second and last lecture. I saved the best for last. And um, I, the pointer is right here, good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about topology and modness in the Haldane, Kamele, and Bernadette used design models. So it was done with uh, my postdoc, Pei Mai, Jin Chao, you heard about his work yesterday. And we talked constantly with an experimentalist and I'll show you some of his results, which helped cement our thinking on this. Is there an echo? There is an echo. It's from mine, right? Okay, sorry. Okay. So, hmm, okay, so I think the echo has gone away. So just to briefly introduce the models I'm going to be looking at, the Haldane model is, was the first, it wasn't the first, but um, certainly the one that we care about most. First one that really showed how topology can obtain without a magnetic field. And you have these chiral next, neighbor, next nearest neighbor hoppings, and there's one here, which is shown right here. So they have opposite phases. And there's no net flux in each plaquette. You can write down the type binding model for this. And what you obtain are bands which have an index. And I'll tell you what this index means in a, in a few minutes, but all of you should know what this index is. It's a term number. And they're doubly degenerate, spin up and spin down. And the lower bands have term number net minus two, the upper ones minus, uh, the upper ones plus two. If you're sitting right here in the middle, you're in a state which has a net churn number, and that will give rise to an anomalous quantum Hall effect. The k Lee model is the time reverse, is the time reversal invariance of this, uh, invariant rather, of this model. And you can obtain these models via the same sort of construction. All you need is two atoms per unit cell, you need spin orbit, and you can obtain this by setting this phase equal to the spin times pi over two. As, as a result, it's the model will be time reversal invariant. And what you obtain, since it's time reversal invariant, is no net churn number below half filling. So this band, the spinful bands, one will have a churn number one, the other one minus one. Um, and as a result, if you define the spin churn number, the difference between the spin up and spin down churn numbers, uh, band <coughs> indices, you'll end up with a net number two. And this is then an example <coughs> of the quantum spin hall effect. And all of this physics is obtaining in a half fill band. The gap is set by the topology, hence it has to be related to, to psi, and it's equal to this number right here. So that's what we all know. Let me just briefly review what, how you obtain the turn number. If you just go and construct all the eigenstates and take this derivative to find that quantity to be AI, what you're looking for is a discontinuity across the Brillouin zone. If you simply go and construct this quantity, it stands for the antisymmetrized uh, derivative here. Um, only if this function here is singular is this number non-zero. And that's just telling about the flux through a two torus. So the um, question I asked at the beginning is, is it possible to get quantum spin hall and quantum anomalous hall away from half filling? The way these models work, those are the, that's the only place you can get it. And the other thing is the quantum anomalous hall and quantum spin hall shouldn't be observable in the same system. One breaks time reversal invariance, the other one preserves it. So it'd be weird if there was a setup in which both of them were present at the same time. Okay, 
So I want to ask, is this the full story? So um, at Cornell, experiments were done on AA stacked, a TMD material. And here it is right here. And what they observed is strong coupling physics, a transition between an insulating and a conducting state as you change the gate voltage or the density, but nothing special. Okay, so no topology. This is AA stacked. Now, what they did is they said, let's go to AB stacking, where the metal and the calcogenite are now, the, these two systems have been rotated. So these align on top of one another, rather than metal to metal. And so this is a moray pattern. And what they saw, so here are some details about the fillings, you know, four electrons per moray cell, and but it's indexed with this number here, here's what NM is. What they saw is rather surprising. So zero field, there's a non-zero value for the for R, X, Y. And it's trained to either be negative or positive as you reverse the value of the field. Okay? So there's a quantum anomalous Hall effect. And the R, X, X is in fact zero approximately zero. So this seems to be consistent with quantum anomalous Hall physics. On non-zero transverse resistivity, vanishing um, longitudinal resistivity. Okay, so is this just Haldane physics? Is this just, is this just consistent with um, this model of these complexified hoppings, which there is no net magnetic field, but it breaks time reversal invariance? Okay. Let's look at what they really saw, at the filling that they saw this at. They saw that the quantum anomalous Hall effect is occurring at nu equals one, not nu equals two. The reason why it occurs in nu equals two is that that's the gap. And supposedly that's where the gap is, the topological gap. And you need the topological gap, gap to get these protected edge modes. Um, the band structure in nu equals one doesn't admit such a gap. And the more surprising thing is they also saw a feature at nu equals two. And this here is the quantum spin hall effect. So we have quantum spin hall and quantum anomalous hall in the same sample. Here are some details about the quantum anomalous hall. Uh, if you measure the gap from transport or capacitance, the gap does not seem to vanish. Certainly, if you go from nu equals 2 to nu equals 1, you would expect something like that, but that doesn't seem to be going on. So the things you have to explain, why is it at nu equals 2? You have no churn number here, you have non-trivial topology, but the gap does not seem to be closing. And the other thing, of course, is why are both of them occurring in the same sample? Now, within the Kaberly model, or the Haldane model, you have valley polarization. So you expect then uh, this to be pointing like this, and this like this. Uh, there are many types of models that have been constructed to explain this effect, but they all kind of encountered an obstacle with the following experiment, which showed that in fact, uh, the system is valley coherent. Both of these valleys are contributing. Okay, so it means this is not the correct way of thinking about this problem. So what the experimentalist said is the following. This doesn't seem to be the correct way of, trying, uh, of assigning the spins with the valleys. Perhaps what is going on instead is to flip them so that here you have this and this is down and here this is up and this is down. But you'll see immediately and if the blue bands have one 
sign of the churn number, these the opposite. If the band is completely full, then you have a net churn number per spin, which is impossible, which means this is not a complete model. In fact, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so that's the problem that we are faced with, but that I'm telling you about. And so you have to explain why do you have quantum spin hall effect? Why do you have quantum anomalous hall effect in the same sample? How do you get all of this physics, a transition between these two states without the gap closing? And how do you explain this valley coherence? Okay, is it clear what the problem is? Okay, now there's no other knob to tune in these, in, as a theoretician. If, if, so the only knob that we can tune, I mean, if you just start with, with, with Haldane and Kane Lee, then you're done, there's nothing else to do. But you're seeing this interesting physics, so clearly you have to look at, for, the, for some other way that you can answer the problem. Are interactions important? Okay, in all of these TM, TMD materials, RS is extremely large. And we tabulated this in the previous paper indicated right here. So the interactions are clearly important. In fact, in different contexts, TMD materials have been listed as great candidates for um, Vigna crystallization. In fact, some of that has been found in the, in the Berkeley group. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. So the interactions are clearly important. So let's do the best job we can of solving um, interactions plus topology. Okay. Okay. And the question I want to ask is if you have topology and strong correlations, can you make any exact statements? Now, you can make exact statements with topology because it's basically non interacting physics. When you put the two together, once again, people will just do hard to fuck and you get out what you put in. Can you do better than that? Okay, so before I go on, let me just make sure we're all on the same page. And let me just review what the Hofstadter spectrum looks like because I'm going to be showing you some pictures where I have magnetic flux as a function of filling. So the, the, the Hofstadter spectrum is, par is parameterized by two numbers. This is a straight up formula. An intercept, and if it's plotted as the filling versus the, the flux, this number R is the churn number. Okay, so I'm going to show you a series of plots which have the flux on this axis, the y axis, and n is now the x axis, so it's the inverse of this. So, in fact, the slope here is the inverse churn number. You read off the churn number by taking the inverse of, of these numbers. Okay, so what we, what we did is we simply took, since you want to know what the answer is, without being unbiased, took the Haldane model with Hubbard interactions, and we just put it on a computer. Picture is an expert in quantum Monte Carlo, and we performed the terminal of quantum Monte Carlo. Okay. And you might say, well, there's sign issues. Yeah, well, we went as low as we could go, and then we stopped. Okay. So everything I'm telling you about the sign problem is everything I'm showing you has been minimized. If we were to go to lower temperatures, there would be a problem. But the results don't seem to uh, butt up against that particular issue. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, flux against filling. Uh, the slope here is 1. Inverse of 1 is 1. And in fact, so you see at nu equals two, a quantum hall, a quantum anomalous hall state with a non-zero churn number. Exactly as you're supposed to see. That's the only place where you see anything interesting going on. Yes. It's slope two. Inverse slope two. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it, it has to be two. Yes. What does the color stand for? Um, the color is just the intensity. 
is the deal for? It's the, you're, you're looking at the flux versus N. So it's, we're looking at the compressibility. We're looking for peaks in that. Okay. Okay. So this is exactly what we're supposed to see at U equals zero. Okay. Now we want to turn on U and see what we end up with. Okay. This is what you have. A U equals 12. This feature here, which had a non-zero slope, now is an infinite slope, which means the churn number at U equals two is now zero. Which means this is now a trivial insulator. In fact, it's a mod insulator at U equals two because of these strong interactions. That makes sense, this is the half-fill point. But you see something else going on. You see now, without doing anything, we haven't put in any order of any kind like that, you see that there's a non-trivial feature at U equals one, and a U equals three. Okay, on either side symmetrically around half filling. Okay, let's look at that feature. Which means there's topology at one fourth and three fourths. And this is in the Halday model, which would mean this would be a quantum anomalous Hall state. And what we did to make sure that this is a serious feature, we set the mass the Semenov mass equal to one, which would get rid of, which would make all of these uh, states now topologically trivial. In fact, the slope goes away. All of these are now topologically trivial, which means this feature here is something real. Okay, then we looked at the spin correlations. So it's the spin compressibility. You won't exactly what we're looking at right now. Okay, and there is a peak in the spin susceptibility at u equals one and u equals three. And once again, at, U, at m, equals, when m is equal to one, topologically trivial, all of these features go away. Okay, and we, um, this is the compressive, this is just the spin susceptibility. Here is the churn number, the churn number is one, which is consistent with an anomalous, a quantum anomalous Hall state, and this is just a, a system size scaling of this. Okay, so we seem to have a state at u equals one and u equals three quarters from quantum Monte Carlo that is consistent with a quantum anomalous Hall state, and at u equals two, it's just a trivial insulator. What's the parameter m? It's the mass, it's the center of mass. Oh, it's the mass. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Remember, how they just put in these chiral yeah, things exactly. on top of that model. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now, so that's the quantum anomalous, that's Duncan's model. Let's do the same thing, since we have a computer and the page is incredibly talented. Let's do the same thing for the K-Milli model to see if this, if this is a universal thing. Okay, so here's the compressibility. This is the flux versus N. Any slope here would indicate the inverse slope would tell us about the, uh, the churn number. So this is a U equals zero, and we see exactly what, what we're supposed to see. Left and right moving Landau levels, uh, an infinite slope here indicating zero churn number. And so this is a quantum spin hall effect. Peaks right here in the susceptibility, magnetization that vanishes, a U equals zero. A U equals 12, we see now this thing goes away, and what we have is just a trivial insulator at U equals two, but know what we have now. We have quantum spin hall states at one, and U equals one, and U equals three. And you have this feature here, which is also a peak in the, in the susceptibility. So the appearance of topology at U equals one quarter and three quarters seems to be coming out fairly generally from these two models. Okay. Now, let's see how general this is. The nice thing about the Kane Billy model is the bandwidth of each band is now, uh, they can be separated, unlike the VHC model. So let's take the flat band limit, where one of these bands is flat. And that's particularly relevant to these experiments. So this is what the structure would look like at U equals zero. And here's what you find with the compressibility. This is U equals zero. 
your quantum's call states, if, if the filling is large enough, so you're occupying this band, it's basically non interacting. That all of this is non interacting physics, but this is just the effect of what you would normally see without the band being flat. The band being flat, there's no dispersion here, and that's what you're seeing. Okay, now in this geometry, or in this with this set of dispersions, let's look and see what we what, what we find out. So you see now at one quarter filling, a quantum anomalous, a, a quantum spin hall state, or just a quantum anomalous hall state. Just, just the standard uh, quantum spin hall state right here. And of course, up here is just the standard uh, quantum hall states. And if you go to a small, a larger value of U, this will turn into the quantum spin hall. So quantum anomalous hall, quantum spin hall, as you change the strength of the interactions. So even in a model which wasn't supposed to um, give you anything like a quantum anomalous hall, the interactions can induce that. Now, what we find is if we lower the temperature, the quantum spin hall gives rise to the quantum anomalous hall. Okay. Now, yes. When you're looking at these plots, how can you tell whether you're seeing an anomalous or spin? If you see two, you see both left and right. Lambda levels. Okay. Okay. For example, this right here. Um, so this is a time reversal in the very magnetic field. So you're just looking for a, for a, a straight slope. You turn that off. You see both of these right and left moving lambda levels with this feature right here in the middle. That's the standard signature of the quantum spin hall effect. Okay. This is just the VHC model, and that's what you expect. Okay. And here's the spin susceptibility. This is the peak right there. Okay, um, but now, but this feature is a quarter filling. Okay, so all of these models, K Milley, um, Haldane, and VHC, give you topology of one quarter, where in the non interacting system, there is no gap, and hence there should be no topology. Yes. This might be a rather detailed question, referring to the previous slide on magnetization. In the experiment, I think they found that the magnetization only saturates at a very high field. But it seems that from the third column, the magnetization saturates rather quickly. Um, do you have a comment on that? Um... So, uh, for a quarter, uh, in yeah, for this right here, right? Quarter. Okay, okay. So, so, how do I identify the magnetization here? Yeah. Okay, we look here at this cross at the new plus one state, and no, this doesn't bisect this cross, which means there's a net magnetization here. Okay, which means it seems like the system has ferromagnetic correlations. Okay. Now, uh, as a function of field, um, it's, I mean, you really have to stick a new, right at this point right here, so I can't really answer your question, okay? Because there, there's an asymmetry here, which is indicating there's a net magnetization, and that's all we can say. Okay, so those are, the results from just putting this problem on a computer. Any of you could have done this, okay? But no one did it, okay? Okay, now, um, remember I showed you this right here? This is what this looks like as a function of, uh, this is mu versus the, the uh, flux. This is exactly what you're supposed to see if you have quantum spin hall physics. So we knew we know that these are quantum spin hole states. And it's occurring at one quarter filling. So that's the whole uh, play on words in the title, one quarter is the new one half. Okay, the, the, the question is why? And that's what I want to spend the rest of the time discerning. Okay. So I've done a simulation. I think if you're being honest, I think we did a fairly good job. 
we aren't hiding anything under the rug. I mean, there's nothing like yesterday <laughs> until <laughs> now. Okay. 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 So, what do you, what do we get if we solve the HK model? Okay. What do we get if we solve the HK model? Well, I wouldn't be here if the answer weren't identical to the quantum Monte Carlo. So to be a spoiler, that's what we get. Okay, so let me just walk you through this. So here are the Halde bands. Remember, the HK model doesn't care what the kinetic energy or the band dispersion looks like. Okay, because it's the interaction in momentum space. Um, here's a slight generalization, okay, uh, of this between the bands or within a band, okay? But this term commutes with this one, okay? Now you know exactly what the answer has to be. So here's the band structure in the Halde model if you, or in any of these models, MSD has seven off maps, okay? So good. This is what you get, okay? Um, it's just the, the, the standard picture, these are spinful bands. The chemical potential lies in the gap. There's no churn, there's a net churn number below, net churn number above. But each this blue thing is really a is really a composite of an up and a down band. And they all have the same churn number. And when I turn on interactions in K-states, anytime I put two electrons in the same K-state, part of this band will start to move up. And the doubly occupied part of this band will also move up. But the singly occupied part will remain the same because that's just governed by the topology. So let's see what happens. As you move through here, the hashed ones, um, yeah, the hashed ones are the, are the doubly occupied ones. These are the singly occupied ones. And what happens is, here this is a metal, and this is now a quarter filled Mont insulator. So the doubly occupied part of this of the spectrum has to move up in energy, which means if the chemical potential now sits right here, you are guaranteed of having topology, but in the quarter filled state. Okay. And you don't calculate the uh, you know, the turn number for these things is zero, but there's a net turn number for each of these bands. Okay. So you need the you need the, the strong interaction to push these bands way up here, so they're disconnected from this. So then now it's really a the, it's it's really now the case that it's it's the it's monotonous that is driving all this. Although the gap is set by the topology, because remember the distance between these two doesn't change. Okay. We can do the same thing with the uh, K-Milli or the BXC models, and it's the same picture. Okay, each of these is now spin degenerate, but note that the constant energy U, when I put two electrons in the same K-state, the doubly occupied part will move up, keeping these the same. This has turn number, uh, now it's become sort of puzzling, how do you assign the turn number? Because you would think then the down part would have turn number minus one and the up one uh, minus one. That's not exactly the case because you have to preserve SU2 symmetry. So you can actually go and calculate this. And the computation is indicated right here. It's actually half of what it was. And that's why the turn number is, is equal to one. Okay. And then, but there's a problem with this. This does not seem to be the ground state of the system. An infinitesimal magnetic field will polarize the system. And hence, this will have to give rise to the quantum anomalous hall. Which is why I, I claim that, and that this is what seems to be the case, high temperatures, it always seems to be quantum spin hall, low enough temperature, it's quantum anomalous hall. Okay. Now, we come to this question. So in fact, this is how we did this. We first saw the HK model and saw there was something funny going on at one quarter. Then we did the simulations and everything agrees. Okay, so why should the Hubbard model 
give you exactly this new non-trivial physics at one quarter as the HK model. Now, the reason why this result is significant, the Hubbard model has mixing between all the different momenta. You write the Hubbard model down in momentum space at three different, three different momenta. The HK model, none of that is going on. It's just diagonal in momentum space. There's no way of even re relaxing the momentum. But the two models are giving you the same physics. Why? Okay, so this is what I was referring to, uh, Ophelia, yesterday, that I said this is the... Okay, so why is one quarter special? Okay, um, so let me just review what I did yesterday about the uh, instabilities of the Fermi liquid. Um, you scale towards a, uh, the uh, Fermi surface, and if you have local interactions and you're in the thermodynamic limit, you have a spherical Fermi surface, there are no local interactions that you can write down that will deviate from that physics. Okay? The only instabilities are BCS and a charge density wave. So the question you ask is, is this really all there is? If there is, then you know, there's really nothing that I should be doing. So you ask the question, is there an operator that has a scaling dimension, which is more negative than that of the chemical potential? On some level, that, that is the question Duncan and Anderson asked uh, in 2000. And um, okay, so as I commented on yesterday, there are two conserved currents here. There are four operators. Symmetry group is O4, and uh, O4 has two relevant subgroups, one that has proper rotations, improper rotations. This is SO4. This is uh, Z2, which is the quotient of O4 with SO4. So their point was that there's an extra Z2 symmetry, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on right now. I'm going to amplify my statements from yesterday about the role of this Z2 symmetry. OK, so you can see exactly what the Z2 symmetry is doing if you just construct the Majorana basis. You take sums and differences, and then you operate this matrix on this. And what it does, since there's only one minus sign, and notice the determinant here is minus 1, you are interchanging these two operators. And if you are interchanging those two operators, you're saying, that the system is invariant under this transformation. Now, clearly the Hamiltonian is not invariant under that transformation, okay? But it is invariant under that transformation at one particular point. Right at the chemical potential where the Hamiltonian is equal to zero, I can make this transformation. So their point is that Fermi liquids have an extra symmetry which is present for a small locus of points right at the chemical potential. And at that point, you can make this transformation. Now, this is the transformation for only one of the spin species. This one remains the same. OK, so then you destroy Fermi liquids by doing, by getting rid of the Z2 uh, symmetry. And the simplest way to get rid of the Z2 symmetry is this term that's commented on yesterday. So this symmetry, once you break the symmetry, you'll be guaranteed that the physics now will be in the strong coupling limit. Okay, that's not true. What you're guaranteed is if you put this term in, you're guaranteed that the physics will be in the strong coupling limit. But it turns out that all interactions break this Z2 symmetry. Okay, and th that's really the, the crux of it. So this term is odd under Z2. The important thing is that this particular interaction that we've written down is scaling dimension minus two, and hence it's relevant. If it's relevant, it can't be in the weak coupling limit. It has to destroy Fermi liquid theory. If I added the Hubbard interaction, that also breaks the symmetry, but we know that there's a perturbative limit of Hubbard. There is no perturbative limit of this. And the reason why there's a perturbative limit of Hubbard is that is there are three momenta. Uh, all of these different operators have different scaling dimensions. This one is fixed. Okay. 
So this has to be a new fixed point is what I talked about yesterday. This is the Hatsugai Komoto model. And okay, now I want to look at this paper from which all of this came. It's just a page and a half paper um, by uh, Phil Anderson and Duncan Haldane. And what's interesting about this paper, I had lunch with Duncan yesterday and he admitted something. Um, but I knew about this. If you look at this paper, this is the form of the interaction they write down. And they say short range repulsive interaction that maximally violates the Z2 symmetry. Okay, now what is odd about this interaction? This is your only quiz in this whole week. <laughs> what is odd about this interaction? Come on, you guys, you should know this. Yes. They don't specify real space room. They don't specify where you are. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's my next thing here. Um, where are the indices? Okay? They say it's short range, but there are no indices here. Oh, I had lunch with Duncan yesterday, and he said, you know, we knew at the time that this interaction, this Z2 symmetry required the interaction be written in momentum space, but they didn't know of any model like that. It's because they, in addition to the Z2 being broken, the, the Z2 is really only broken if the interaction is relevant. But we know there's a perturbative limit of the Hubbard model, and that was what Phil was obsessed with showing that somehow the Hubbard model is in strong coupling and they thought this hard would, would, would do that. This is only true for the HK model. Okay? So not only do you have to worry about what symmetry is being broken, you have to worry about the power counting. It is the interaction relevant? Which means the relevant question is, is the physics non-perturbative? Okay. Okay, so the reason why we're getting the same answer as, as Hubbard, when U is large enough, Hubbard's in the non-perturbative limit. HK is always in the non-perturbative limit. Okay, and this has this mock transition. And um, here are the, and you see upper, lower, and upper Hubbard bands. And this is generated entirely from long-range interactions. It makes sense that the lower and upper Hubbard bands Anytime you talk about band structure, you're talking about something that's non-local in real space to begin with, the kinetic energy, for example, it's just a hopping of all the sites. To get band structure, you need a long-range part of the Coulomb interaction, I would say. Okay, now, this, of course, gives rise to this problem of the singly occupied sector and um, being uh, have, having the generacy of 2 to the n. Uh, as I said, one of my colleagues, Barry Bradlin, has shown that we don't, we don't need to worry about that problem so this is what the system that the band structure looks like in just a plain HK model. You have a two to the end degeneracy, but you can get rid of that by using a dimer constraint, by just using a dimer construction. So you have a two band type, uh, you have a two atom per unit cell, which is what you have anyway in all of these uh, topological models, and you still have the zeros. But now the degeneracy is just of order one. There's no longer a thermodynamic quantity. Yeah, so, so that's all solved. Okay, and what I showed yesterday is, uh, yeah, there is nothing local that you can add to this, and it's a cortex-stable fixed point. And the superconductor you end up with is not BCS, it's this very peculiar one that we, that has very, that has properties quite distinct from BCS. Okay, now, there was a question yesterday. Are there two fixed points? Okay, so HK is one of the fixed points. And the question arose, is there a new fixed point from Hubbard? And are these two distinct? What we haven't shown is if you start from this, do you end up with this one? Okay, but what we did show, because we know that this is stable to all local interactions, if we were to add Hubbard, so the question is, does this black dot equal this red dot? Okay, we know that if we, if we were to add Hubbard, nothing would change here. 
because Hubbard is not a relevant perturbation to this, which has a scaling dimension of minus two. Okay, now I would I would argue the following. If both of these fixed points break the C2 symmetry, then they have to be the same fixed point. Or if this is broken at both of these fixed points, then they have to be the same. My universality and the fact that both of them then would be the non-perturbative limit. And I don't see any reason why you would have two non-perturbative fixed points that break the same symmetries. Okay, and I think that is why we're getting the same answer from Hubbard and HK. When there's no a priori reason why scattering in, you know, scattering between various momenta and just looking at one particular one is giving you the same physics. Okay, um, I don't really want to talk about that. It's not necessary. Okay, now um, let's get back to this. So that's all for the theory of why everything is going on. Uh, I think it's about a fixed point and at the large coupling limit, both Hubbard and HK are telling you, telling you they're in the same fixed point. And that's why the two calculations are the same. Okay, what about the experiments now? Okay, um, we showed that this is not the right uh, way of thinking about this problem. What you have to do to complete this, to get valid coherence, is you have to add another layer in which these are reversed. And, um, sorry, um, sorry, this is not right. Uh, this is just, this model doesn't work, that model doesn't work, right. So what you have to do is add another model in which these are reversed. Okay, K and K prime are now interchanged, okay? And this bilayer, uh, system models this bilayer system, but, but models the experiment, the electric field that's coupling the two. And if we can simulate this on a computer now, we can do quantum Monte Carlo rather than just one K milli band, uh, one K milli model, two of them. So it's an eight band model that we're now simulating. Patient did the calculation. Now, of course, the filling will go from zero to eight. And what you see now is something fairly spectacular. You see quantum anomalous hall at one quarter, quantum spin hall at uh, e equals two. All of the odd ones are quantum anomalous hall. And this is in the flat band limit. So this is just the standard quantum hall physics. So e equals one and three will be quantum anomalous hall physics, whereas all the even ones will be quantum spin hall. So you have both of them in the same sample generated entirely by the interactions. So that's the prediction. That the odd ones are all quantum anomalous hall, the even ones are quantum spin hall. Okay, so Ben Feldman did the experiments and here's what he found. Um, I wouldn't be showing if it didn't agree with the experiment with the, with the theory. Um, new equals one, okay, this has a slope here. And experimentalists do really, you know, measure the compressibility and they just read it out from the straight of formula. Okay, so here, mu equals two and four, no slope at all. These are quantum spin hall states, zero churn number. The quantum anomalous hall states are mu equals one and mu equals three. And before we did this, there was no way that anyone in the community could understand why mu equals one or three would be quantum anomalous hall. And there were some hard to calculations, but that didn't really tell you much. Okay, so I would say it's a, this is strongly coupled physics, entirely interaction induced, and it's because the lifting of the, the spin degeneracy of all, not the double and single occupancy of these bands. So it's entirely mock physics. Okay, now, uh, quantum anomalous hall should be, the signature of that should be ferromagnetism. And as we see right here, the spin susceptibility, if u is small, doesn't seem to diverge. U large enough, it does, the one over the chi s does seem to go to zero, which means there's a threshold of u for the ferromagnetism. 
And this is occurring spontaneously. Uh, it's no, it's not put in by hand. Okay, now, this question of the gap. Well, I start off by saying that we can't understand um, the one quarter is a mystery because there isn't a gap in the non-interacting system uh, at one quarter, and hence there shouldn't be any topology there. Okay, so what this seems to indicate, we look at the gap, there's a single particle gap now, um, is that this is a measure of how flat the band is. As the flatness of the band goes up, the threshold for the gap goes down. Okay? So the flatness of the band, and you can make the bands in k milli one arbitrarily flat relative to the other. You can't do that in the DHC models. Okay, now this indication of topology is occurring right here, where in fact u is less than the threshold to create the gap. So we have here a situation in which there is clear topology. There's a non-zero slope here, flux versus n, indicating a quantum anomalous Hall state, but there's no gap. And this is entirely made possible in an, in an interacting system. And it's occurring now at one quarter. Okay, we're still working out the details of this, but that seems to be what is going on. Okay, now the question that um, putting interactions in all these top in these single particle topological models, the question that in, in, immediately comes about is how do we think about the invariants that you normally would use for the non-interacting system uh, relative to the interacting system? So what this means is the following: uh, if you have an if you have a, an edge state that crosses the chemical potential, okay, if you move the chemical potential from here up through this region, you should see a change in the Hall conductance. Now, the dashed lines are different. The dashed lines are zeros. These things are poles. So as you cross the chemical, as, as you move the chemical potential up, you can cross either a dashed line or a solid line. And here's a band of zeros right here, a band of zeros right there. The question arises, does it make any difference which one you cross? And are there invariants which distinguish between these two kinds of crossings? Okay, now in a free system, um, let's define N1, and the index here tells you the number of products of these things you have. Any function of this form uh, will be the difference between the total number of poles minus the number of zeros. For, for a free system, I'm um, sorry, I guess I didn't, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, ah, what just happened? Okay, uh, there's a technical problem there. Okay, M3 is this quantity right here. And for a free system, this quantity is identical to the churn number. Okay. The Luttinger count is related to a similar sort of quantity. This is the integral in momentum space where the real part of the green function is positive. Oh, here it is right here, it's on, it's on this slide. Okay, so N1 is just one product of these things, both minus zeros. Um, there are no zeros for a free system. And if you just count the poles, you will trivially end up with the Luttinger count. Okay, because it's all perturbative physics. And what about interacting systems? Okay, so does N3 equal C1? Does this give you the churn number? In other words, does any time N3 changes, does that tell you about a change in the Hall conductance? Which is a really, which is a major thing we know about topology. Okay, so here's why you might not suspect the two things are equal. Um, so we want to look at HK plus Haldane uh, in, the, in, in, in this model as a function of the interactions. There's a, there are a band of zeros right here. 
If the chemical potential sits right here above these two, um, N3 is equal to zero, because there's no net turn number down here. Now what happens is the chemical potential, and the only way the whole conductance can change is if the chemical potential moves from here up to here. So any time N3 changes, but the Hall conductance doesn't change, then there's a disconnect between the Hall conductance and N3, which is impossible for, an inter for, for a free system. And it's impossible because there's nothing like this in a free system. But clearly you see something here. If this crosses this band without even getting up here, you can change N3. If you now put this in the middle here, N3 is equal to minus two, maybe this, whatever the churn number is here. If it's sitting in the middle, it's sort of undefined quantity. Okay, so then what I want to show you now is the general behavior of this for the Haldane model. If there's a difference between this dashed line and the solid line, then the two things are equal. N3 is indicated here, C1 is here. And as you see, in the vicinity of quarter filling, there's a breakdown of the correspondence between N3 and the term number. Because you're crossing that the band of zeros is giving a non trivial uh, contribution to N3, but purely moving the chemical potential through zeros, since zeros have no particle content, that cannot change the Hall conductance or the churn number, but it changes N3. Which means all of these papers in the literature, and there have been several recently, that N3 is really a topological invariant for topological index, rather, for an interacting system is not correct. Okay, so the reason is the following. If you're looking, if you're looking at these derivatives of G in respect to K, for a free system, that's just equal to the derivative of the kinetic energy. But for an interacting system, and if you were to stick this now into the current, you wouldn't be you would, you would be making an exact statement. But for an interacting system, this quantity has a contribution from the self-energy, from all of the interactions. And hence, the standard replacements that you make in the, in the conductance don't work for the interacting system. There is no simplification to the current operator. And that's where the breakdown is occurring. Okay, so let me get to my summary. It seems that in the presence of interactions, you solve the Hubbard model, the HK model, this picture seems to be emerging. So let me tell you the simplest story I can about the Hall, but the quantum Hall effect. The quantum Hall effect is summarized by this equation. Uh, two equals one plus one, you have two edges, they're chiral edges. It's just the number of x states. In the quantum spin hall effect, you have two edges on each, you have two x states on each edge. Four is equal to two plus two. There's no backscattering because the spin over pre pre uh, uh, prevents that. In the presence of interactions, these now are split they correspond to four distinct poles in the green function. And they, these are indicated right here. So in this case, four is equal to this redundant formula. But it's telling you something profound, that each of these now will occur at a distinct energy because of the interactions, whereas you didn't have that over here. So these circulating edge currents now are all shifted up because you can't put two electrons in the same one and uh, without paying the cost you. And it doesn't matter whether you use Hubbard or HK, you get the same number, as long as you're in the strong coupling limit. So I say that's the answer to your question. And um, the, the uh, actually this should be reversed. <laughs> Uh, it's always the quantum anomalous hall at low temperature, quantum spin hall at low temperature, provided that U is sufficiently large. So we have to rethink what we normally do about uh, topology in the presence of interactions, and this is the basic summary.
Thank you. Why do you get quantum spin hole at high temperature but quantum anomalous hole at low temperature? Can you understand that from these bands? Um, no, no. Um, right. Um, the fact that they exist are from this, but that has to do with the spin with the spin susceptibility. It just seems as if the ferromagnetic correlation set in at low temperature. Okay, so the quantum quantum anomalous hall doesn't seem to be, sorry, quantum spin hall doesn't seem to be preserved. The symmetry is broken spontaneously as you, as you lower the temperature. Which is why um, that it seems like the, you know, the, the Hartree Fock people are getting results which are agreeing but there's nothing fundamental about that. So maybe, uh, turn it on. That does help, yeah. Um, so this may be an idea question, but if you took the Helding uh, Hubbard model and treated it like a heavy fermion problem, do you also get topological bands? So what, what would I, oh, okay. So what would I have to do there if I were to treat it as a heavy fermion problem? I, I guess maybe you just, I started enforcing like a double occupancy constraint and then okay okay so let me tell you something as i said many people now are doing this hk type simplification someone recently solved the condo lattice model uh, using the hk model and they got out the standard and you can do it exactly um and they got out the stand you know this picture that many people have been pushing this two fluid type of model so that's as much as I know about that. We have not done that. We've been trying to figure out what is the next big thing to do. Which, and this was now topology rather than looking at uh, heavy fermion physics. But really, that's a very interesting thing to go and do. Uh, so, so do you have a theory for why why the gap does not close? At the... Ah, okay. <laughs> no. Okay, that is an evolving story, and we have not reached a clear picture on that yet. Okay, certainly within quantum Monte Carlo, it seems as if the gap is um, uh, yeah. What seems to be happening in quantum Monte Carlo is that whether or not you have a gap depends on the flatness of the band. Okay, and, um, but, yeah. Um, so sometimes you have, you have gaplessness, okay? And you still have topology. Um, HK can be richer. I, I just don't want to say anything about this right now, um, but I do know one thing. I, we talked to this, at least my postdoc talked to experimentalists at Cornell last night, and apparently that might not be so clear. You know, without the gap close Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a very big thing, okay? And I, you know, when you, I think it's good to use experimentalists, get the, the big picture, and you know, quantum, oh, uh, it's all quantum spin hole, but this gap thing is very subtle. Can comment a little bit on that. So for HK, because of the simple form of the simple form of HK, it treats the upper band, the non-interacting upper band lower band separately, then it can just open the gap. But uh, in in the presence of Hubble interaction, um, it um, it opens the gap for each band, but at the same time it also makes the original upper and lower non interacting band. So when the band becomes dispersive, it may happen that it just won't open the gap because of this uh, mixing of momentum. Yeah, it's harder to, yeah, I mean, HK is always clear, you know, there are these four poles, okay? Hubbard, well, it might not be. He can't really, there, there's dynamics, right, between the bands. Um, so it's harder to make statements about gaps in Hubbard than in HK.
Same thing on lines. So, Ophelia, that's the answer to your question. Um, I guess, um, yeah, I will go to the back end. Yeah, I think you would have to come up with a reason why there should be two fixed points. We have the same symmetry that's broken. And I don't see how that's possible. Or why that would even occur. Because how would you distinguish them? Um, I don't think so. Let me, let me check real quick. I don't see any. Um, okay. So, so I'm glad we made it. We only have uh, one actor in the afternoon. So let's thank Dr. Uh, Philippines. And there was actually some interest in taking a group photo with everyone from the summer school. Um, so we're planning on doing that right now for lunch. So whoever wants to be in a photo, please come to the front. Yeah. 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 Yeah.